Welcome to Lesson 10, the Swiss Alps. If you're not familiar with the Alps, it's a very famous chain of mountains in Switzerland. These mountains have been studied for hundreds of years. They're the classic type location of studies in structural geology. And it's just really because these mountains are so darn confusing and there's so much rock to see. If you look at the rocks in the Swiss Alps, they're all twisted and deformed and basically just confusing. You really need to map them in huge amounts of detail for further study before you can even touch the subject. And that's exactly what geologists of ancient times did. Well, not that ancient, the 1800s anyway. And so we'll look at one fellow in particular, Hans Conrad Escher von der Lind. Rolls right off the tongue. He was a great geologist and he studied the Alps in great detail. One of the biggest findings that he had and that we'll look at is known as the Glarus Thrust. We have to remember that geologists at this time didn't have the same tools as we have today. They couldn't date rocks radiometrically, so they couldn't come up with absolute dates. They could, they could relatively date rocks, so they could from cross-cutting relationships in outcrops, find that one set of rocks is younger or older than another set of rocks. So that was something. They were at least clever and uh, resourceful more than anything. They also didn't have any sort of mechanism of how all these rocks in the Alps got all twisted, deformed, and folded. It was sort of a mystery. There were some theories, but they weren't particularly convincing. And so what they did, in essence, was just trek through the Alps. Some of these great geologists, Escher von der Lint and uh, Albert Heim and Edward Seuss, they, they would trek through the Alps. And this was a really physically demanding ordeal. They'd trek through the Alps, map the rocks and the units that they were looking at very precisely and then they would go back and make models of it in their offices so that they could actually sort of study a 3D representation of what they had seen in the mountains. You have to study it at that scale because if you just look at one little deformed outcrop in the mountains, it just, it's just overwhelming and you can't take that much. You have to really broaden the horizon and look at it from a larger perspective. And that's what they did. Anyway, so Escher von der Lint, he found the Glarus thrust, or studied it in depth anyway. And what it is, is a horizontal feature with light rocks on one side and dark rocks on the other. And it's just a line across a chain of mountains in eastern Switzerland. It's kind of an interesting looking thing, but it's fairly nondescript. You can only even see it because of the extreme vertical relief in the mountains. Otherwise, you'd just see, say, the rocks on top. Anyway, so you can see this line cutting across the mountains. And there's one little piece of information that makes it an entire puzzle. And that is that the rocks below are young rocks. The rocks above, which are a different type of rock, are old rocks. Now this violates Steno's law of superposition. You remember that? We went over that in one of the early lectures. And that was just that old rocks, when formed in traditional settings, like a sedimentary setting, should be older. So you get the old rocks on the bottom, and then progressively you build up more rock that's younger on top. So you get young rocks on top, old rocks below. But the Glarus thrust was the opposite to this. The young rocks, the most recently formed, were underneath, and the old rocks were on top, which is impossible. <laughs> so how did it get to be? And Escher von der Lint didn't answer this. His successor, Albert Heim, another great geologist, went into more depth. And he found that the geology and geography of the area suggests that 
you could perhaps have the older rocks come from here and thrust up onto the younger rocks. And that way it would work. That, that hypothesis could lead to this situation of young rocks underneath, old rocks on top. But it does raise a small problem. How do you move essentially <laughs> mountains on top of each other? Not only that, but as I mentioned, the geography of the area demands that those rocks came from, say, 40 kilometers, and they've traveled 40 kilometers horizontally. So you would literally have to come up with a process capable of moving mountains to describe what's going on at the glarus thrust. So here we are in the era of Albert Heim, and this is 1850s to say 1900-ish. And it can't be explained with any contemporary theories. It would take advances elsewhere before we could even touch this subject. And it wasn't even until the 50s that we could definitively say how the glarus thrust got to where it is. So that's where we'll go next. But the Alps are the classically instructive place for geologists to study this sort of thing. And if you ever get a chance to go, I really recommend it because it, it's inspiring more than anything. And learning about what these geologists did to find these things like the glarus thrust, the things they went through, it's, it's quite amazing. And, and I encourage you to look it up further.